On a continent full of many, many challenges, optimism is something that sometimes can be hard to come by. But Henley Business School Africa believe that optimistic leadership is what is required. And they've set up a leadership centre to look at aspects such as this. I caught up with the Dean and Director of Henley Business School Africa, John Foster Pedley, and this is for the record. So, you've launched this um, leadership centre, mm -hmm. and, and I just wonder, um, tell us a little bit about its core value. What is it about? Well, it's based on a study of leadership. It started in the UK many years ago, and with a professor called Ben Fogel, who's built it up, and we've opened it here in South Africa. But its core value is really about understanding leadership as not some little thing you pick up from a book. It's a life, life experience, a life journey, but it's based at heart on an optimistic view of life. And of course, use the words optimism, and you're triggering I don't know how many people raging in hate, and how can this life be in any way optimistic? And that's what I'd like to talk about, how optimism actually is at the heart of nearly every act of activism, every act of protest, every act of improvement, every act we do in our daily lives is based on a form of optimism. But it's very fashionable to descend into cynicism or negativism. Um, and I think we have to understand the difference between cynicism and discernment. You know, cynicism and critical thinking, they're two very different things. Mm. I'm going to ask you to define optimism a little bit because, mm. you know, for some of us growing up, it, I think that for that song, always look on the bright side <laughs> of life. Yeah, I've seen that one. <laughs> and is, is, is that what optimism is or, or not? Well, it, that's such a parody of it. But yeah. when you watch Monty Python sing that, you can't help but somehow be stirred in yeah. yourself by yeah. the sort of naivety of it all. And people do think of optimism as pure naivety, but it's not. I mean, there is a form of optimism, which is that, and that's not what we're talking about mm. here. It's not the sort of Pollyanna-ish here, life is fantastic. It's not the denial of how hard life is. Um, there's a very famous author called Viktor Frankl who wrote a book called In Search of Meaning from his experiences in concentration camps. And he started a form of um, logotherapy, a form of psychotherapy. And what he talked about are three types of uh, survivors from those really dire situations. The ones who are super optimistic, didn't last because every time their, their ideal crashed, they just couldn't bear it. The negatives, the cynicism, uh, the cynicists, and those people who really couldn't and um, you know couldn't see that anything positive living for also didn't have anything in themselves to sustain them through the hard times. And he invented this term of tragic optimist. The people who understood that life is full of struggle and unfortunately people dying and loss and grief and sometimes sickness. That is part of life. It's part of all our lives as we well know from what we've been through over the last three years. That doesn't mean that life itself is not worth living. In fact, even more so, it's worth having the strength and resilience to carry on. We've all said it's not how many times you get knocked over that matters, but how you lift yourself up. And that is an act of courage and optimism. So there are fantastic attributes embedded in optimism, like courage and resilience and persistence mm -hmm. and hope and seeing the good things in people not let your judgment be clouded by all the other stuff. It's an act of inner discipline to understand that life is somehow, it's all we have, it has to be worth living. And people are fundamentally intelligent and smart, although very many people don't act that way. And you have to learn to live with that and handle it too. All right, let's translate that into leadership and mm. our continent. And uh, I found out the other day the average age of an African something like 19 years, 19.2 uh, or something. So we're a very young continent and you talk about optimism and we really face things on, in, on the continent in Africa. If it's not power, it's uh, uh, droughts, it's extreme weather conditions, it's poverty. So what kind of leadership is required in our continent and can this optimism work in the leadership of the continent? Well, I think it can, but I'm going to start with a mm. very short personal, personal note. Mm. I'm very privileged to be an educator and we teach people MBAs and many other things. And what happens in South Africa, that only about 8% of people get a first degree within, of school leavers, get a, a first degree within leaving school. That's way below the international averages, 50, 60% in some countries. What do they do? They go into the workplace, but they're smart. 
but they don't believe they're smart because they haven't got the academic qualification. We're all blessed with the same brain. Anywhere around the world, we're all, we're all the same. We are fundamentally the same. We're blessed with the same gifts. And what we see in South Africa is people coming through a lot of hardship into education, recovering it, and seeing themselves lift. You should see their faces when they discover that this whole bag of nonsense they've been sold is purely that nonsense. As people, they're capable, they can do things, they're internationally capable. So I think what we have to show in South Africa is two things. Firstly, the elders have to step up. We talk about the youth, mm -hmm. but who creates the conditions and hope? It's the elders. They have to be the realistic ones who are not cynicism. They, they have to be able to accept that they've done things that aren't perfect in their life, but they've continued to see life as it is, and they have to give that guidance to the youth. They have to create the conditions for youth to enter life and see that it's worth living. Mm -hmm. And I think the eldership is something that's incredibly important. Eldership is not a status you haven't revealed. I know there's cultural aspects mm -hmm. to that. Eldership is something that should come with wisdom and insight and compassion, real compassion for people, because you've been through it. You should know something. You know, you've been through it. You yeah. should know something. Yeah. Um, the other thing is youth themselves. You know, we have to understand, we have to help youth understand that the world is out there, and even though you might be in hard conditions, the only way to improve through that is continual resilience, persistence, courage, effort. There is, no, there is no gift given to you in life that you'll just make it. We have all the characteristics we need as human beings to have that resilience. South Africans have that hugely. I wish I could share some of the stories that I've seen, and you've seen so many yeah. yourself, I know. But that's the basis of what we call hope. Not hope because life is perfect. Hope because life is, has to be worth living. And only through the hope of having courage, being activists, being knocked down, coming back, can we build it better? And that's what we have to teach people. I think you've given me some clues for my next question. And optimistic leadership then, what, what would it look like in the workplace, in the boardrooms, in uh, entrepreneurship? What, what does optimistic leadership actually look like? Well, there is, there is, not, there is um, obviously, it starts with a self-insight. It starts with mastery of yourself. What, what I do struggle with is people who say that we must all be empathetic, we must all be compassionate all the time, and we must all somehow be soft and engaging. It, life isn't like that, life is hard. In fact, there's a great book by uh, an academic called Jeffrey Pfeffer called The Seven Rules of Power. And he says, this is how people who get power get it. They don't have to be good or bad people, but these are the rules by which people uh, get power. And some of it quite, what? You want me to do that? I say, well, this is how people acquire power. The, the choice is how you use it. And so you have to learn to acquire power because unless you have power, how are you going to influence everything? There's soft power, there's hard power. I don't mean you want to be autocratic, dictatorial. You've just got to know how to use power because if you want to make big changes, you want to pull big levers and you want the right people pulling the big levers. You want the right people with their hands on the big money. You want the people who care about others in society. You want the right people in those positions. So if you're a leader, you've got to understand, I think, that you have to listen to people, you have to know yourself, but you also have to move people towards an objective, towards a purpose, because that's what unifies people. The difference is, what is your purpose? Is this something that feels clean and to other people, or is it something that you just sense is deeply self-interested, narcissistic, corrupt, whatever? Sorry, I hate to use that, that narcissism word because it's thrown around like, yeah. all over the place, and, and, and just because somebody has those selfish circumstances don't mean they're pathologically a narcissist. But at the same time, leaders have to understand those dark sides of themselves as well. You know, the narcissism, the uh, psychopathic aspects that people have, neuroticism, you know, and the manipulation, the Machiavellianism, those are part of what they call the dark, dark <laughs> track. <laughs> yeah. You have to understand that about you because, because they are tools that you must use towards a good purpose and not, not just run away from it. You can't run away from what's in yourself. You have to handle yourself. You have to understand who you are. And those are the people we need. People who are humble, sure, but driven, and have an objective. And that objective is that improving all our lives, not just making money for themselves. Um, th and this next question I maybe should have asked a little bit earlier, but I was just, I'm curious, what is happening in terms of leadership right now in your view? Well, uh, excuse me, Peter, yeah. but I watch you on TV. Are you going to hate me doing this? But can I please ask you something? Right? Yeah. Because you, I've no, I don't know anyone who's interviewed more people about leadership than you. And I was just thinking before I came here, yeah. I really wish I understood what you thought about leadership. I'll answer it. <laughs> Could you please? <coughs> You've met so many people. What are the common factors in leadership? Do you know, for me, actually, I, 
I mean, there's different types of leaders, political, all that kind of thing. But for me, I've always found that those that put people at the center of what they do tend to be the ones that find the right kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about a business. Uh, I mean, I was an auditor once in my life, and uh, one of the tests of whether a business exists or not was you go to CIPC and there's a certificate of incorporation. But what we know for sure is that a business isn't a piece of paper at CIPC. Mm -hmm. It is all the people that make up the business. And so if you get a business, a leader who understands the people in his business and knows how to get the best out of them, they tend to be the ones that are the better leaders. That's been the sense that I've gotten. Madiba, he was a people person. And so you find them, people want to do things for you because you get a sense that he sees you or they see you. Uh, so for me, I mean, there's many layers to it, but one of the things that I've seen the most is if you center yourself in people and understand people and find ways to motivate, inspire, and um, uh, bring people on board, they'll do a lot for you, and they probably won't even be asking for money in return. And, and, and you mentioned Madiba, because this, this, what came up for me when you said that was, Madiba had these incredible standards and a vision for people. So he wasn't like a soft person. He would lose his temper. He would be very direct on when things weren't to his level. So it wasn't, but that compassion, that empathy for people wasn't also the acceptance of low standards for himself or for others. So there's that harder aspect yeah. to it I'm sensing. Did you find that as well or not? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So now you were cheating now. You're telling I, us I, I, I'm very sorry, but I just, <laughs> I really need to know what you know, but anyway, I'll shut up now. Yeah, I mean, and it, it, yeah. is, it is a big journey. Um, mm. But I think also uh, honesty uh, and sincerity is, is quite important. Um, but these are long conversations and uh, we don't have time, unfortunately. But I do want us to perhaps end um, talking about the future of our continent. And um, mm. as I said, <laughs> and, 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 and I'll go back to the idea mm. of it's a young continent and how much must we include young people in our leadership? It's everything. Mm. You know, the young people, our job as people who are middle aged and beyond is to create the circumstances for the young to succeed. Not that we can't take it with us. So, you know, and just helping our family or our, our kin or whatever it is, isn't going to help anybody. You need the dignity of having done something for, for mm. them. That there has to be a deeper sense of who you are than just the security can come from accumulating personal wealth. You have to do something useful. And where's that sitting? That's sitting with the youth through school, through teaching people trades. The disaster of our T-Vets has to be turned around and can be turned around providing decent education to people with, with good connectivity, providing new forms of work. The OECD said just a few years ago that only 55% of South African workers have the skills for the current economy, let alone the ones that are emerging now. So we have to get fast and adaptive. So there's some very radical things that we need to do, which will create enormous opposition. So we are going to have to be, in a sense, warriors of a sort, who are optimistic warriors to give the opportunity of youth. And we have to look at youth. We have to understand what's in them. It's, you've got the exuberance, you've got the sort of teenagers and people act, act strange, but underneath that is creativity, sharp, sharp intelligence. We have to let go of what we may believe about people and change the system to give opportunity for that. And it's not just about giving youth entrepreneurial opportunities either. There's plenty of research that says that middle-aged entrepreneurs are much more successful because they have some experience. Create more middle-aged entrepreneurs, they will employ the youth and apprentice them as well, rather than just turning youth around. So there's plenty of transformations to be done, but we can do it. And the fact is we must, we have no option for our families, our children, the whole of South Africa, the whole of Africa, in fact, even beyond that, we have no option mm. but to create opportunities for our children. However hard that is for us, we have to take that on. All right, and perhaps a final question. You're an educator. Mm. Can this optimistic type of leadership be taught and learned? I think it absolutely can. I think it's caught as much as taught. Mm. You mentioned Madiba. And, I, and that's um, why people who meet other people like that often can mirror so many of those attributes themselves. 
I think you can teach elements of it, but I think you can create circumstances where it's much, much more likely to, uh, to emerge. Great educators are not just teaching to a script. They're creating a multi-level experiences where people challenge themselves, think, see things, and their brains light up and start to, start to connect and see things they couldn't before. You can't just tell somebody that. They have to get to know it. And then they have to connect their, that with who I am. You have to give people the optimism to try because it's only through trying that you'll truly learn. So the repressive forms of education are terribly bad for growth. They're terribly bad for hope. And the hope I'm talking about, the optimism I'm talking about, is not a soft thing. It's a tough thing. It's a very hard thing. It resonates with the very heart of us as warriors and who we are. That's that sort of hope I'm talking about. Dean and Director, Henley Business School Africa, John Foster Pedley. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And to you.